How many points can you place on a grid of a certain size so that no three lie in a straight line? Somehow, this is still an unsolved problem. But unlike some deceptively hard problems, looking at you, Colat's conjecture, we've actually made some progress on this one. We're going to look at that progress, and maybe get some insight on how you can approach open problems in math, or even just ones that you don't personally know the answer to. Let's explore. To start off, it always helps to fully understand our question. Start with a square grid with n rows and n columns. For a given size grid, how many points can we place at the intersection of the lines of this grid so that no three points can be connected with a straight line, not even diagonally? This no three in line problem was first posed by Henry Dudeney in 1900 in terms of pawns on an 8x8 chessboard. One helpful way to start approaching these kinds of math problems is to look at small examples. Here, you could start with small grids, maybe using coins or a pencil and paper. You'll notice that the task gets steadily harder. You can entirely fill the squares of size 1 and 2, but starting at 3, you have to be a bit clever not to trap yourself in a corner. At 4, there start being multiple distinct ways to reach the maximum, and at n equals 5, you have to start considering knight's move diagonals. Here's one possible maximal solution for n equals 5, but there are several more. When going through small grids, one of the first obstacles you might reach is knowing when to stop looking. How do we know that we've placed all the points that will fit? It would be helpful to have an upper bound of sorts, some number of points where, even if we're not sure we can hit that number, we definitely know we can't get past that number. It's time for our next technique, using general math rules to confirm our patterns. If we look at our small examples, it seems like the most points we can place is the width of the grid times 2. It turns out that we can show that we'll never do any better, using a rule called the pigeonhole principle. The pigeonhole principle comes in handy when you're trying to count things placed into other things. It states that if there are n objects being placed into k clusters, then there must exist at least one cluster with n over k or more objects, rounded up. Say you have five holes for 16 pigeons. If we tried to make there be three or fewer pigeons in each hole, we'd only have room for up to 15 pigeons total. So with 16 pigeons, at least one hole must have four or more pigeons. If we focus on just the rows of our square grid and ignore the columns and diagonals, we can treat our points as the pigeons and our rows as the holes. Each row is itself a line, so the rules say we can have at most two points per row, meaning on an n by n grid, we can only fit up to two n points total. So we found ourselves an upper bound, but we don't know if we can always reach that upper bound for every large grid. In fact, the biggest grid for which I could find a 2n solution online was n equals 52. We could keep searching larger and larger grids using faster and faster computers, but in math, we like general statements even more than we like specific solutions. So, what can we say that would apply even to very large grids, say, n equals 1000, or even higher? We already have one useful fact the upper bound of two n points. Maybe we can find a lower bound, too, a number of points where we know we can place at least that many, even if we don't know whether we can do better. The first lower bound that shows up in the literature comes from the extremely prolific mathematician Paul Erdős, though it was actually written up and published by Klaus Roth. Erdős found that for any prime number p, you can always fit at least p points on a p by p grid. The way Erdős proves this illustrates another useful problem-solving technique, rewriting a problem using a different branch of math. Erdős translates this geometry problem into a numerical one. We'll go over the proof now. Let's put x and y coordinates on our square grid, for instance integers from 0 to p minus 1. Erdős says that we can pick one point in each column, such that no three of those points are in line. Here's how. To find your y value, you take your x value, square it, and find the remainder when you divide by p. In fancy math words, this operation of finding a remainder after dividing is called taking a number modulo or mod p. So the points we're finding are the points along the function y equals x squared mod p. How do we know that this method always works? Take any three distinct points on y equals x squared mod p within our grid. Let's call the x-coordinates of the points i, j, and k in increasing order so that the full coordinates of these points are i comma i squared mod p, j comma j squared mod p, and k comma k squared mod p. The slope of the line between the first and second points is just the change in y, 
j squared mod p minus i squared mod p over the change in x, j minus i. Do the same for the slope between the first and third points. If these three points are on the same line, these slopes must be equal. Addition, subtraction, and multiplication work as usual modulo any number. So we can rewrite j squared mod p minus i squared mod p as just j squared minus i squared mod p. And we can factor it as a difference of squares, j plus i times j minus i mod p. We can do the same with the second slope too. It would be super convenient if we could just cancel j minus i and k minus i from these fractions, but we have to be careful here. Weird things can happen with division mod some number. Take 4 squared minus 1 squared mod 15 over 4 minus 1. Canceling would tell you to expect the answer to be 5, but the answer is really 0. But division mod a number m does work correctly under some special conditions. In particular, it works if the dividend, divisor, and quotient are all required to be integers, and the divisor has no common factors with m besides 1, or in fancy math words that the divisor and m are coprime. In our grid, since p is itself prime, p is coprime with all integers that aren't multiples of p. Since j minus i and k minus i are smaller than p, they can't be multiples of it, and since j plus i and k plus i are integers, this all means that we can safely make those cancellations. Now we subtract i from both sides and arrive at j equals k. But we originally assumed that i, j, and k were all distinct. So we arrived at a contradiction meaning no three distinct points from this set lie on the same line. So, Erdős's method always works for a prime-sized grid. Finding this result for prime n is helpful more generally as well. We know we can fit at least as many no three-in-line points in an n by n grid as the biggest prime number smaller than n. So for a 1000 by 1000 grid, that would be 997, which isn't too bad. And as Joseph Bertrand proposed and Pafnuty Chebyshev proved, there's always a prime between n over 2 and n for n greater than 1. So at the very least, we can always fit n over 2 points in an n by n grid with no 3 in line. Modular arithmetic allowed Richard R. Hall and his co-authors in 1974 to take the lower bound even farther. We'll go over their results visually, but we won't fully prove them. Their paper is a little harder to follow than Erdős's proof, but if you want to check it out, it's linked in the description. The authors first prove that you can fit at least n no three aligned points on any n by n grid, regardless of whether n is prime or not. Use Bertrand and Chebyshev's theorem to pick a prime p between n over 2 and n. The equation xy mod p equals negative 1 gives a set s of p minus 1 no three aligned points in a p by p grid that also don't have any two sharing a row. We can prove this by substituting the equation of a line, y equals mx plus b, into our equation. This makes a quadratic, which has at most two solutions, corresponding to at most two points on S on that line that are not equivalent mod P. This description hides a lot of modular arithmetic rules, but Hall and friends prove all the details. We can then take two copies of S, plus one additional point at P minus one comma P plus one, and then place the first N of those two P minus one points in our N by N square. Second, they prove that for any prime P, a 2p by 2p grid can fit 3p minus 3 points, or a little less than 1.5n. Take this same set s of p minus 1 points, split it into four quarter grids, and copy those quarter grids three times each around the outside of the 2p by 2p grid. This big set t contains three copies of each point in s that are equivalent mod p. By the same logic as before, three points in t can only be on a line if at least two are equivalent mod p. This can only occur on a line that's horizontal, vertical, or has a slope of plus or minus 1. The horizontal and vertical lines can't contain three points because they only pass through two copies of S, and the diagonal ones can't because the third point they would pass through would be in the gap in the middle of T. So we've got a lower bound of about 1.5n and an upper bound of 2n. But we still don't know for certain where in that range we can find the best solution for any particular large n. We've got one last problem solving technique up our sleeves, one that you've probably used before. If you don't know something for sure, you can at least make an educated guess. This guess, or in fancy math words, conjecture, comes from Richard Guy and Patrick Kelly in 1968, with a correction in 2004 by Gabor Elman, who helpfully explained much of the proof and his correction to me by email. The conjecture uses statistical arguments. First, we need to figure out what the odds are 
that three random points in an n-by-n grid are collinear. Guy and Kelly do this with combinatorics, that is very fancy counting. And you should definitely check out their paper, which is linked in the description, if you want to see all the details. The trick is to count all points on all lines of all possible slopes. The approximate probability we wind up with is 18 times the natural log of n over pi squared times n squared. Pi shows up here numerically because we do a sum of 1 over the squared numbers, and intuitively because talking about slopes is a lot like talking about angles on a circle. If you don't want to read the paper, but want a little more to go on than trust me bro, here's a quick Python script I wrote up to find sets of three random points and see if they're in a line. And here are the results I got, which do plausibly approach the prediction. Once we have this probability, we can calculate for any given constant k between 1.5 and 2, what the odds are that a randomly selected group of kn points in an n by n grid have no 3 in line. This turns out to be about n to the power of n times negative 3 k cubed over pi squared. Then we multiply by the number of total configurations of kn points, n squared choose kn, to see about how many no 3 in line configurations exist with kn points. The equation for this is dominated by an n to the n term, or more specifically, n to the n times negative 3k cubed over pi squared plus k. This is actually where Elman's correction comes in. Guy and Kelly incorrectly had plus 2 instead of plus k. This term goes to 0 when the coefficient in the exponent is negative. In other words, if k is too big, then we expect there to be no sets of points with no 3 in line just by chance. That doesn't mean there can't be one, just that it's statistically unlikely. Some algebra reveals that the coefficient is negative when k is more than pi over root 3, or about 1.8138. So the conjecture is that this is the limit. For an n by n grid, you're not likely to be able to fit many more points than n times pi over root 3 without having three of them in a line. So, we've worked our way from a fun little puzzle about a chessboard to the literal edge of human knowledge, where mathematicians have only made educated guesses. Hopefully, you can see why it made sense to take each step along that journey in our quest towards the solution. Open math questions like this one are all over the place if you keep digging, and just as old ones are being answered, new ones are being asked, often ones that we only know to ask because of the answer we just found. So, get out there and explore. And as always, Thanks for watching. This video is part of 3 Blue 1 Brown's third Summer of Mathematical Exposition. Feel free to check out my submission from last year or submissions from other entries. 